نه اول تصویر رو صحبت کنم بعد فایل رو بیارم بعد شما میتونید چیک کنید اون ورس صدا ما رو دارن؟ نه دارن؟ صدا خوب است دکتر الان؟ صدا خوبه؟ الان صدا خوبه؟ آلی. یه نفر ولی نویس آلی بله دارم به نیمون خدمت میدم بله 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 Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first, I must thank from the organizing committee of the Clinical Microbiology of Iran for inviting us to this symposium for microbacterial disease. And we have two distinguished speakers. Uh, the Professor Grillo and Professor uh, Totam from the Turkey. First of all, I must thank from the all the speakers that invite the invite invitation of the clinical microbiology for this uh, panel. First of all, I must invite uh, Professor Grillo for his talk about the uh, NGS for the transmission of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Professor Grillo, we are waiting for you. Uh, dear Dr. Tabarsi, could you unmute yourself?
Okay. Uh, first, I will try to summarize our uh, experience about treatment of the MDR TB in Iran and some uh, highlights from new guidelines and new manuscript that has been changed. The, uh, guidelines of the treatment of MDR TB, and then we will go to Professor Krilov for his speech, for her speech. Uh, treatment of the multiple drug resistant tuberculosis in Iran has been for uh, more than 20 years ago. Then we start to, to treat the patient with some standardized regimen that was consist of the, some drugs such as cyclosterine, proteonamide, amikacin, ofloxacin at that time, and the uh, isoni high dose isoniazid. And with this regimen, at that point, we have something around 70% success rate for the uh, treatment of these patients. After that, the Ministry of Health has been built some program for more uh, for region for treatment of TB. And then we start treat patients with the, this standardized regimen for the MDR TB. And as uh, you see, our success rate was around 67 percent with this regimen and the mortality was around 18 percent in this patient that was higher among the iranian than afghans patient at that time after that we see that some patient who died due to treatment of the mdr tb had multiple drug resistant to all drug that we have used at that time for example they are very, very resistant to ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, amikacin, canamycin, and all of this drug, at that time, we have not the definition for total drug resistance or other form of the extreme extensive drug resistance. After that, it was seen that some form of the totally drug resistant tuberculosis has been grown, and some of, them, some of these patients were totally drug resistant to all drug that we used at that time that it was very uh, difficult to treat patients. After that, uh, we engaged in the multi-center study with uh, Professor Menzies in the Canada about the treatment of the patients and regimen outcome in, in an individual patient data meta-analysis. At this first study, it was seen that if you use four or more drugs, in the regimen, and if you use, for example, some drugs such as moxifloxacin and the later generation quinolone or etionamide, the response to treatment must be better than the other drugs. So some change was done in the WHO guideline for treatment of the MDR TB, and at that time we uh, write a protocol for Iran management of the MDR TB of Iran and the guideline for treatment of the MDR TB in Iran that it was first we must confirm that the uh, species is Mycobacterium tuberculosis and then we do drug susceptibility test, then confirm that it is MDR, then we go to a standard regimen and monthly sputum till 20 months of the treatment that at that time was the protocol of Iran till one year ago. After that, WHO has changed a lot the classification of the drug for MDR-TB based on the articles and manuscript for the treatment of the MDR-TB. And they, at that time, it was, we must say, for example, first levofloxacin, then an injectable agent, then two oral agent. And if with this agent, we don't complete four drugs, we add other drugs such as, for example, atambotolopirazine at that time, if available, beta cooling. After that, due to uh, Bangladesh regime and WHO has changed something about the short course treatment for MDR-TB. And they said if the patient has not exposure to second line antituberculosis agents, is not pregnant, has no extra pulmonary disease, they, they can go to the short course regimen that is around 12 months with some drugs in the intensive case and then 
for continuation phase four or more second line drugs. And uh, you see the, the drugs for this uh, second line regimen. This was then one study in the Europe that they have seen that in some country, the person who are eligible for the second, this short course regimen may be very low. For example, in the Eastern European, only seven or four persons were eligible for this short course treatment. But in contrast, in the Brazil, it was around 50 persons were eligible for short course treatment. In Iran, around 40 to 70, uh, 50 percent of the patient are eligible for this short course treatment if we use, for example, one year of this treatment. After that, in the second round of this individual patient data meta-analysis by Professor Menzies in the Canada, that our center was also involved in this study, there was two manuscripts, one about the treatment of the isonized monodrug resistance that we see that if we use at to these three drugs, Rifampin, etambotol, and pirazinamide, the treatment success will be greater. And for more than 10 years now, we are using this regimen for isoniazid monodrug resistance with the success rate of more than 90%. And in another manuscript about the MDRTB, it was very interesting findings that use of linezolite, levofloxacin, carbapenem, moxy, beta and clofazamine was associated with a higher rate of the response amicacin, modest benefit, but canamycin and capromycin were associated with worse outcomes. So based on this manuscript, the classification of drug has been changed that now we use levo, bedaculin, linezolite, clofazamine, and cyclosrine for the backbone of our regimen in Iran. And with the, now we don't use amicacin for first if the patient has not uh, tolerance to one of these drugs or one of the drugs cannot be used for the patient, then we use another drug, for example, such as amikacin or meropenem for this patient. And our scenario has been changed by this uh, manuscript about this uh, article. As you know that the, these are the odds ratio for the old treatment for this drug. As you know, as you've seen, the levofloxacin and beta -coline has better outcome for this if we engage in these drugs in these patients. For, for the duration now, we use 18 to 12 months for the treatment of the MDRTB. If we use short course now, we have one trials in Iran that we use 12 months of the treatment for patients who are candidate for short course treatment. And we hope if in the future, we have uh, available for pretomanid or other new drugs for treatment of the TB. We change again the tolerance of uh, again the, the regimen of the MDR TB in Iran. As you know, in Iran, like many other countries, COVID has influenced the tuberculosis program, unfortunately. And now, for example, we have uh, every month two or three MDR TB cases, but now for the at least six months ago, we, and unfortunately, we have not found any case of the new MDR-TB. This is the, in, in, in the, at the influence of the COVID that most of our hospitals has been occupied by the COVID patients and the patient fear from uh, going to hospital because of this COVID crisis. And we hope that in future we can uh, overcome these barriers. At the end, I must thank again from the organizing committee I see the Professor Krilo that is now available, and I invite Professor Krilo to have uh, her speech about the whole genome sequencing for tracing of the transmission of tuberculosis. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Tabarsi. And uh, probably there was a misunderstanding because I was told to speak after you. So this is why I was, I was just the next door. So, but that's fine. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I need to share this one. No, this one. Okay. OK, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for this invitation. It's very nice to be at least virtually with you. You know that I have a long-standing relationship with many scientists in Iran. I'm also hosting some, of, some people from Iran in, in my laboratory, so I'm always happy to visit your country, although right now for the COVID is not possible. And um, so my presentation is on the use of whole genome sequencing for surveillance for M tuberculosis. As a conflict of interest, I might disclose that I am a member of the European Reference Laboratory Network Consortium, and I was the PI of the EUSEC MITV grant that was awarded to my laboratory at a five European laboratory in Europe uh, two years ago. And uh, I am working uh, on the promotion of molecular diagnostics uh, um, for both uh, surveillance and uh, oh dear. and um, for both surveillance and drug resistant detection. Uh, this is my outline. I will touch base on the molecular surveillance tools, the old and the new. The whole genome sequencing definition, why are we shifting to whole genome sequencing? And I will talk a little bit more about our cross-border clusters in Europe and what is the ECDC effort. And conclude with the next, the, the, the way forward for this technology. Why do we need to do molecular surveillance for M tuberculosis? Because that allows us to identify the transmission dynamics globally and within a population. Allow us to monitor the strains epidemiology at the global level, so worldwide, but also to track transmission in a single uh, place, in a single town, in, in the single hotspot allows us uh, to use the classical investigation that is always uh, a key point in a, in a better way. So saving resources, because we can target our effort in, uh, in a community where we really see the same strain circulating in different people. Allow to target interventions, so we know that in different countries, the epidemiology of TB is different. So there are different high risk population where we need to target our intervention in terms of public health. Allows us to differentiate new infection from reactivation and failure. This is important, not only because we need to say, to, to say if a patient that had previously TB has a, an infection with a new strain and not a reactivation of the old infection, so it's not a failure, but is really a new um, case in terms of the, um, of the strains that is uh, supporting the disease, but also is really important from the research point of view, because whenever we try new drugs, we try vaccine, we need to be able to, to follow up the, the patients, the cohort of patients, and that if we see new cases in patients that are treated with new regimen, we really need to find out if this is a failure of the regimen or in high burden setting is a new infection for um, a different strain. And then also allows us to identify clones with specific characteristics. We are collecting more and more evidences showing that not all the clones respond equally to antibiotics. And we may have shift in MIC for different clones. So if we really want to move to personalized medicine, then we may need to gather this information in order to provide the best available treatment to the patient. 
But let's go back to the uh, surveillance uh, topic. We have been uh, um, typing our strains uh, um, since uh, the 90, I would say. And uh, uh, we started typing with this polygotype and then we shifted as uh, uh, per indication of the European CDC to MIRU VNTR. Until a couple of years ago, in fact, the European CDC in Stockholm was collecting from all the MDR European strains the new VNTR profile that should have been uploaded by each single reference laboratory in the different countries. But what are the limitations? Those technologies are fast, but they do interrogate only small fraction of the genome. They only represent the surrogate markers. They don't give any information about the drug resistance, as you know, and they lack discriminatory power, especially in highly conserved genotypes, such as the Beijing lineage. And uh, they uh, don't give the uh, information of what could be the within host uh, evolution. With these technologies, we can rule out transmission. So if we have two mu VNTR at 24 loci profiles, we can rule out transmission. But we cannot rule in transmission. So we can really say that if you, you have the same mu VNTR profile as well as the same spoligo profile, you could be in a cluster, but you could also not be in a cluster. So that will require resources for epidemiological investigation. This is an example from the, all the strains from the UK in 2017. Uh, in the UK, almost 50,000 TB cases were notified. Uh, almost 30,000 were culture confirmed, so they could have mu VNTR done. And uh, 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 almost 82% had the mu VNTR done. Among those, almost 60% was in cluster with at least one other case. Is this meaning that all of them are transmitting? In reality, no, but that required a large number of resources to inquire if that was really a transmission because that was triggering an epidemiological investigation. We now have available whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing is used now for all the topics that you see in the population of genes to drug resistance is increasing every day. And there are several researchers that are really working on it and they publish the, what we call the uh, eye confidence uh, uh, mutation. So the one that we use as a marker for drug resistance, despite a different phenotype, and for those, we trust more the genotype than the phenotype. But uh, in, uh, in this case, we can uh, say what is the role for the epidemiological and transmission analysis. Let me start with some definition. Whole genome sequencing versus next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing includes all the technologies that generate high throughput parallel sequence reads allowing DNA or RNA assembly in a short time and with a cost that is becoming lower every day compared to the classical sequencing. Full genome sequencing is sequencing the full genome or the majority of it using next generation technologies. Even with bull genome sequencing, we do not align the bull genome. So we are still relying on what, in the majority of cases, in what we call the core genome. That is a set of genes that we use for 
in an algorithm really for tracking transmission. But the whole genome sequencing is, is becoming the reference for diagnostics, for tracing outbreaks, for surveillance. Generates a massive amount of information, requires culturing. As of today, we cannot um, retrieve a bull genome sequencing with a decent cost in, if we don't want to invest a lot of money in only one, in one strain, one sample, uh, from, from, a, from a, a biological sample. So we need to culture the biological samples in liquid culture. And from early liquid culture, then we can start sequencing. And this is a limitation. It may become, become different in the future, but for now, this is what we use. And then we have another technology that is targeted NGS, such as the Dplex technology with the, provided by GenoScreen, that allows to do primary, uh, primary diagnostics directly from specimen, doesn't give us the information for surveillance that we need because only provide us the strain um, type and the, and the this polygotype. So it is really insufficient for the transmission. It's a very good tool for drug resistance diagnosis. Why are we moving to VGS for MIOV and TR? Here in this paper from Jennifer Gardy in 2011, you see the reason. If you look here, you look at the MIO VNTR tree, all of them are the same. So you have a huge cluster. When you do full genome sequencing, you don't have a cluster. The strains are really all different. So there is no transmission here. It's just the strains that are very similar, but there is no transmission. So from the public health point of view, there is not a cluster. What is the threshold that we need to use to say that strains are in cluster, most likely in cluster, or are unlinked? This is the, the work that was done uh, by Timothy Walker, a published in Lancet ID in 2013 and Nature Genetics in 2014 showing that if you look at the strains that, epidemiological, that are epidemiological li linked, so brother and sister, same family, very um, well-known modality of transmission, you see that they, the majority, have zero SNPs. When you move to seven SNPs that still are very, very close, uh, you start having strains that are epidemiologically unlinked. More than 13, they are basically all epidemiologically unlinked. So we use the uh, as a cutoff between zero and five. But as will I will show you, the majority of the very recently transmitted strains are between zero and three. Uh, we are now moving uh, to uh, the, the implementation of whole genome sequencing for surveillance. And, uh, for, and uh, that was really promoted by the European CDC after this study. So what happened uh, uh, two years ago was uh, exactly uh, that. Uh, we, uh, along the coast of Europe, we had a massive uh, uh, immigration from some region uh, in Africa in 2015 and 2000. It's not part of the European Union, but still is, is a country with a different status, and so is not reporting to CDC noticed that they had an increased number of MDR cases uh, from people coming from Somalia, young people coming from Somalia. So they contacted the ECDC and the ECDC um, sent an alert to all member states um, and in the alert they sent the MIO VNTR profile asking to uh, look 
for the strains with this mu VNDR profile, and um, if possible, to provide full genome sequencing on those strains. The resistant phenotype was quite scary because it was an MDR resistant to capromycin, sensitive to uh, quinolones. So at that time, for the strains could have been classified as a pre-XDR strain. So the reason why the strain was um, uh, resistant to capromycin was that because in this particular lineage, the capromycin is an early marker. So it is, it is really a lineage, it is, it is, um, there are SNPs that are um, more marker than this particular group of strains than associated to drug resistance, but still confers resistance to capromycin. So what happened was that uh, all uh, the countries that had a profile, a similar profile, provided the sequences. And as you can see, those uh, sequences were not related despite having the same mu, but almost 29 plus additional two in, in Italy, where so 31 strains, um, were identical. Those strains had less than one SNP difference of difference uh, uh, between each other. So there was an um, epidemiological investigation that showed that most likely the transmission uh, uh, occurred in a Libyan camp where all these people uh, share the, uh, the, the same barrack, the same uh, lodging, and then they move towards Europe. And once in Europe, the most of them arrived in the south of Italy, and they, they, they move across Italy, and they started spreading out in all the European countries. Based on that, the ECDC promoted uh, the, the increase of use of full genome sequencing. The same happened with a second wave of migration uh, from the Horn of Africa. That's the same, it's a similar cluster that occurred in November 2017 from a refugee from Somalia. Those were notified uh, at the end of 2017 and 21 strain were identified by ECDC in seven EU member states, and they were collected by, from 2009 and 2016. Again, we provide the full genome sequencing whenever possible, and the results is uh, um, um, summarized in this graph. As you can see here, some of the strains are not related. But there are at least 11 strains in, uh, four different, in three different countries for the majority that are instead closely related. And what, what can see here is that even among the strains that clusterize, the one that are at zero, are at zero SNPs are the one that are collected in Italy and Switzerland. Italy is the port of entry and the people that were diagnosed in Italy were the people that could made to Switzerland going across the Alps. So they really represent the same cluster. Instead, the people in the Netherlands and in Sweden, they do represent an older migration and the strains were collected um, in fact five years earlier. Based on those, the ECDC decided to move on with a massive program for sequencing all the MDR strains across the European um, country. And uh, the, the project started in 2018 and is now at the end. In fact, the results have been recently published in European Respiratory Journal. What was the scope of the project? to evaluate the systematic use of full genome sequencing based approach for reform, from MDR surveillance in Europe. And then what we expected as an outcome, to get a better understanding of the MDR strain diversity and the number of cross-border transmission 
across Europe. To increase access and contribute to build capacity on the use of whole genome sequencing technology in all the states that right now don't have sequencing capacity. And then to really um, provide recommendation for the future. And uh, in fact, based on this study, the ECDC is now moving to the full genome based surveillance in this region. We have collected more than 2,000 MDR strains from 25 EU countries, considered that Malta relies to uh, the, the UK and um, the Luxembourg didn't have any strain, so basically we covered all the European uh, countries. And uh, we have standardized the uh, analytical approach in terms of pipeline. And we have standardized the approach including two pipelines. One is the core genome, MSLT, and the other one is a SNP-based um, pipeline. Those are the results. We had a coverage of almost more, more than 75% of all the MDRTB cases in 2018. The lineage distribution showed that 65% are Euro American, 30% Beijing. Then we have less of Delicas, EAI, East Asian, non Beijing, and West Africa. The drug resistance uh, uh, pattern is also reported in the slide. The high majority were, MD, were MDR, and 27% uh, were resistant to fluoroquinolones, and 15% uh, were uh, considered XDR, considering the definition of XDR that we still use and was used at that time. 16, so less than 2%, uh, were carrying mutation predicting resistance to bedaculin. And this is very good, being bedaculin now one of the key drugs for MDR treatment. The results in terms of cross-border uh, identification and clustering rate, we identify 1,000 cluster case both in national and cross-border cluster. We identify 56 cross-border cluster with a clustering rate of 0 0.1, so not very much. And the, um, in the cross-border cluster with um, at a different geographical distribution. If you look at the distribution of the cross-border cluster, you can see that 2.2.1 uh, is the um, is the, the, the major cluster. And the majority of the cluster uh, MDR are in Romania, Lithuania, Germany, and Italy. And the uh, country with the highest percentage of cluster MDR were Italy, Austria, Sweden, and Belgium. The majority of those MDR strains are linked to foreign-born people. In fact, you can see that uh, those countries have the highest percent of clustered case among the foreign born people. If we look at the major cross border cluster here, we had, uh, I, I'm just presenting here the three major cluster. The first one is particularly interesting because it's a cluster including strains from three different countries. 70% of the people are born in Romania, but the cluster are isolated also in the UK and in Italy. Unfortunately, part of the strains, what you see here central, that are partially, that are isolated in Italy, so this is a branch of that cluster, are uh, carrying a mutation that makes them resistant to bedaculin. So this is a scary cluster if it goes around. Those are other two clusters that are linked to migration from Sub-Saharan Africa and represent the tail of the clusters that I presented to you uh, in the previous slide. 
So if I can conclude as a major conclusion, I must say that the whole genome sequencing has a higher discriminatory power and mostly likely to be able to subdivide clusters defined by the classical MIUVI and PR genotyping. The proposed cutoff value of six is just the, the preliminary cutoff. It predicts links by conventional epidemiology, but probably we will need to redefine this uh, threshold, uh, lowering this threshold to really uh, capture the very recent transmission. BUGS allow to distinguish between isolate sharing identical genotyping pattern, potentially separating transmission chain within a MIRUV and TR cluster. It identifies false clustering, ruling out false transmission events. Again, I like to remind you that this six SNPs is not an absolute cutoff. It may be decreased in the future, especially in drug resistant strains. And very recently, the EU SecMITB project from ECDC has demonstrated that the full genome sequencing based surveillance can efficiently monitor the dynamics of country and cross border transmission of MDR across the European countries. And with this, I would like to thank my collaborator, my international collaborator, and all of you for listening. Thank you very much. And I'm here to answer to any question you may have. Thank you very much, Professor Krillo, for this very interesting presentation. I have one quick question about the resistance to beta -coline. What is your suggestion right. about the resistance to beta -coline here? Uh, what do you mean? In this case, in this cluster, there is uh, okay. Uh, we do a lot. Of, we have done a lot of work on resistance to beta -coline. The resistance to beta uh, in the main target, the RTPA is, is is very, very, very rare. What we are talking about in the majority of cases is resistant to. Uh, <coughs> Is low, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> low level resistant on the gene RV0678. That confers resistant to clofazimin, uh, resistant to low level uh, uh, to bedaquilin. In reality, for bedaquilin, uh, we are observing the same phenomenon that we have observed with pyrazinamide. So, resistance uh, mutation are scattered uh, to all genes. And there are mutations that are associated to an increase in MIC and there are mutations that are absolutely neutral to the drug resistant pattern. So we are coming up with a catalog of mutations that are associated with drug resistance to bedaquiline and mutations that instead are neutral. So right now, the only way to, to predict by genome is to do the, the, the full gene sequencing and then really target the mutation. What we also have observed is the development of the, if, if you keep treating and monitoring with bedaquiline people and you collect the strains, you see that people that start at a certain point fail the therapy, they are developing especially indel, so insertion and deletion in RB0678. So th this is what needs to be monitored. Thank you very much for this very great presentation. At the end, we will, if you have another answer, we will uh, call you for this, the questions. Now we will move to Professor uh, Tanil from the Istanbul Turkey about the tuberculosis diagnostics for everyone. We have Professor Tunnel here or Hello. not? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tabashi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I, I thank to uh, the organizing committee and especially to Mohammed uh, Faisabadi uh, for inviting me 
to this conference. I mean, poi se abbiamo altre domande. To be uh, with you uh, all together. Uh, so uh, today I will try to present you uh, some uh, diagnostics uh, about tuberculosis uh, that can be used uh, in every part of the world, I believe. Uh, so let me share, uh, start sharing my uh, screen about this. Okay. I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is my university uh, in Istanbul, uh, Ajibadem University. Uh, so I uh, live somewhere here uh, in my office. I don't know if you see my pointer. Uh, so uh, as you all know, uh, in fact, uh, tuberculosis is the leading uh, cause of infectious disease that uh, kills most of the people uh, around the world. Uh, so there are uh, about 10 million new uh, tuberculosis cases every year. And uh, one, it is believed, it is estimated that one third of these are never diagnosed. Uh, we uh, take this number from epidemiological studies uh, because the reason for that is there are no uh, inexpensive diagnostics easy to use uh, ev in every part of the world, uh, especially in resource limited settings. Uh, so uh, every year 1.6 million people die because of tuberculosis. Uh, this, is, this number is twice the number uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, killed so far around the world. So uh, everybody forgot about tuberculosis because of COVID-19 epidemic right now. As you have mentioned, uh, you didn't have uh, any MDR cases detected uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 problem in also Iran. So that makes about 5,000 people every day who die from tuberculosis. And this will probably continue for many more years. Uh, even after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we have to uh, go back to our uh, studies uh, also uh, from uh, uh, go back uh, to our study diagnostics and treatment also for tuberculosis again. And uh, tuberculosis constitute 25% of avoidable deaths in developing countries. So if you can control tuberculosis in your country, you can, uh, you can eliminate these uh, deaths that you may have uh, from tuberculosis. Uh, so uh, if you look at the laboratory conditions in different countries, uh, we see uh, the, the green ones here on this table are the things that are available. So uh, you see uh, in some countries, even uh, in some laboratories, there are no uh, running water in a laboratory. And if you go to electricity or something, they are not available. Or PCR tests, I mean, the molecular tests, the sophisticated tests are not available in many countries uh, that have, uh, that are high burden uh, tuberculosis countries. That's why we need, uh, you know, tools to diagnose tuberculosis in these kind of labs where the uh, resources are very limited. I call these people heroes of the laboratories, you know, in these countries. You can see whatever they can find, you know, uh, they try to use to set up a laboratory where they can make TB diagnosis. So, you know, all uh, many of our methods depend on the special uh, structure of mycobacteria which have a very thick cell wall made up of mycolic acid, uh, fatty acids. 
uh, as you know. So it makes very resistant uh, this bacteria to many uh, decontamination agents. At the same time, it gives the feature uh, to use a special stain uh, to uh, diagnose, to make a very good and rapid diagnosis with microscopy. So since uh, 1882, uh, after uh, Robert Koch, uh, you know, discovered that Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the agent of this disease, we still use microscopy uh, as our main tool to diagnose tuberculosis in many parts around the world. And there are no, not much more tools than uh, microscopy uh, in many parts of the world for the, for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. As you know, microscopy is a rapid diagnostic technique. It's inexpensive. However, uh, unfortunately, it suffers of low sensitivity. You need at least 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli per milliliter of sample in order to find a few bacilli uh, under your microscope. Uh, so uh, the other problem is that you need a really experienced personnel uh, for uh, the diagnosis of tuberculosis by microscopy. So uh, an improvement was made to microscopy by the invention of these LED lamps that may be uh, adapted to regular microscopes which turn your uh, microscope into a fluorescent microscope. In this uh, microscopy, you use oramin stain. Now, instead of 100x uh, uh, you know, magnification, you can use 40x magnification. And uh, so you can look at a larger area and it will be easier to find fluorescent bacteria uh, under your microscope. So, uh, but uh, as you know, culture is the gold standard method uh, for the diagnosis of tuberculosis because uh, the sensitivity is very high. And uh, since there are no mycobacterium tuberculosis in uh, normal flora of people, if you can isolate even a single uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli by growing in culture, uh, then you can make your definite diagnosis. However, uh, as you know, uh, mycobacteria grow very slowly in culture media. Uh, so other bacteria that is present in saliva and sputum will grow so fast that they will cover your uh, culture media uh, before you can see the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis colonies uh, there. Uh, so that's why we need to do a procedure that we call decontamination and concentration. Uh, making uh, use of this mycobacterial tick cell wall, which makes it resistant to uh, chemicals like uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, Petrov uh, developed a method in 1915, which was the very simple uh, solutions that he used uh, to make the contamination and concentration. So he used uh, sodium hydroxide to kill other bacteria to decontaminate the sample, uh, but uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis stayed uh, living in this environment. Then he used uh, one normal hydrochloric acid to uh, neutralize the pH of the solution because you have to do this before you can inoculate to your uh, culture media. And you follow the pH by a pH indicator like brom time of blue. However, since this decontamination procedure did not contain any buffer uh, in it, it was very hard to adjust the pH by a very strong alkali substance and a very strong uh, acid substance. So uh, 
Kubica uh, developed a new method in 1963 uh, where he used phosphate buffer in order to neutralize its sample. But this time, even uh, at Petrov method and Kubica method, you add so much decontamination uh, and decontamination solution and neutralizing solution to your sample, you dilute your sample uh, in a great amount. So you have to centrifuge your uh, sample in order to sediment bacteria so that uh, you can catch a few bacteria if they are present in the patient sample. But the problem, there are no centrifuges in this kind of laboratories. Sometimes there is even no electricity that you can operate a centrifuge. So if you can't do the contamination and concentration, you cannot do culture. If you cannot grow your bacteria in culture, then you cannot do susceptibility testing. Of course, uh, there are no, uh, you know, uh, tests like whole genome sequencing methods in this kind of laboratories uh, to diagnose sophistic in a sophisticated manner the whole gene and the whole drug susceptibility. So uh, we uh, thought of a new method uh, to eliminate uh, centrifuge centrifugation from the contamination uh, concentration uh, by using some absorbent beads. So these are the absorbent beads that we use to get rid of excess uh, fluid in uh, a sample doing, when doing the contamination and concentration. And these beads have pores smaller than bacteria and they absorbed a lot of fluid. So uh, when the, uh, the decontamination kit consists of three parts like this, we have a decontamination solution, which is basically, which contains sodium hydroxide and some pH indicator in it, where we put our sputum sample, then we add our absorbent beads and we vortex it to mix it. Uh, and these absorbent beads will uh, absorb all the decontamination solution and the bacteria will stay outside the bead. Then finally, we add this neutralizing solution, uh, which contains phosphate buffer and some acids to neutralize all the uh, sodium hydroxide uh, solution. So here you can see the application is very simple. So we add the sputum sample, we vortex, we wait for 10 minutes uh, for the contamination. Then we add our beads uh, into the solution uh, like this. We vortex and wait for five more minutes uh, to, for the beads to absorb the whole solution. Then we add our neutralizing solution. Uh, the color of the uh, solution will turn now yellow uh, because of acidity. And then it will take about three minutes for the beads to absorb the excess of this fluid. And uh, the sodium hydroxide, the alkali and acid will equilibrate each other and the color of the solution will turn back to pink orange color, which means now you have the right pH and your decontamination is finished. You can take your sample by a pipette tip uh, by going in between the beads and then now you can inoculate your culture media. So, since we eliminate 15 minutes of centrifugation and pouring the uh, sample, the supernatant, uh, from uh, the tubes, uh, the cubica method, which requires 45 minutes to complete 
uh, a sample uh, with this method with Deconics, now uh, it only requires 23 minutes and you finish everything in the same cup you don't have to pour anything outside the cup so it becomes more safe and easy to do decontamination and concentration of course we do a comparison uh, between uh, the kubica method and uh, also uh, the uh, you know new uh, method and we see that we can isolate even more bacteria with uh, the comex uh, in a shorter period of time in average compared to kubica method the reason for that is that uh, probably we do a better pH adjustment which helps to grow bacteria uh, faster than other decontamination method. Uh, after developing this method, we also started to apply this method for identification of stool parasites uh, because this uh, examination also requires centrifugation after homogenization of uh, the stool and especially since we eliminate centrifugation here it was possible to uh, isolate to see uh, to identify more protozoa type uh, parasites uh, which may be bursting uh, during centrifugation okay so after the contamination and concentration we inoculate usually to Lewenstein and some media uh, to grow uh, mycobacteria. However, as you know, this requires uh, four to six weeks to grow uh, this uh, bacteria in Lewenstein and some media. So uh, there are rapid culture systems that were developed to see uh, growth earlier in the system. And all of these systems, in fact, use middle brook uh, medium. Uh, but they have different detection systems. And the midget is the most widely used one, as you know, which detects by uh, fluorescence of a gel uh, that starts to fluoresce uh, over the UV light when there's growth uh, in this tube and because of production of carbon dioxide. Uh, so they all use, other than uh, TK uh, system that I will talk in a minute, uh, they all use Middlebrook broad and have different detection systems. Uh, however, the Middlebrook medium that is used in the systems, uh, in the systems uh, are not ready to use. They all need to add OADC a nutrient supplement, which is made up of oleic acid, albumin, dextrose, and catalase. And also they require the addition of selective antimicrobials uh, in them. So you have to solubilize all this and add to your tubes one by one in order to make them ready for inoculation of culture. Uh, so all of these manipulations, uh, of course, are potential sources of contamination. When you want to do drug susceptibility testing, you have to prepare also solution of drugs, add them to the tubes in order to prepare a drug susceptibility test kit. So the TK media that we have developed are ready to use all the growth factors and antimicrobials are within this tube. And the original uh, form before inoculation of the medium looks like this. It's a red colored medium and it indicates mycobacterial growth by changing its color from red to yellow and contamination from red to green uh, here. Uh, and it can be, so since it's a colorimetric medium, it can be monitored both visually or with an automated instrument. 
So uh, the average growth, microbacterial growth, takes about two weeks, uh, 12 to 14 days uh, usually, compared to levenstein Janssen. In many studies, we have about an average of 25 days in levenstein Janssen and about 12 days in uh, TK Media with the same, uh, you know, samples. And there is usually higher microbacterial isolation rate. Differentiation of microbacterial growth from contamination is possible, which is not possible in other culture systems. And the contamination rate is very low, is about 0.5% compared to 5.5% for levenstein Yensa for the same samples. It is possible to do susceptibility testing and also species uh, uh, differentiation. So although you can evaluate the samples visually, you can monitor the growth visually, there's a pretty elaborate, sophisticated, uh, automated instrument which follow the color change in the tubes. It provides growth curves for each of your uh, sample like this, and you can do susceptibility testing, which are also monitored uh, automatically by this uh, system. So we have done uh, several clinical study uh, using this system in large series of, uh, you know, uh, clinical samples, and we have obtained a highest rate growth uh, at 12 days uh, in TK's selective medium. Uh, these are all the samples together uh, and the growth uh, as we see in at different days in Levenstein and San Media. You can see in uh, this was about 16,303 sample study uh, where we isolated about 150 more uh, isolates in TK selective medium compared to LJ medium. And the contamination rate is, was very low uh, here, 0.55% uh, compared to 5.33% uh, in Levenstein Yensa. So the, this uh, uh, culture system was. Uh, once uh, supported by FIND during development. We got a, a Euro Award, uh, Turkey Award for this. And then both TK culture system and also this DECOMIX, which eliminates uh, the decontamination concentration system, which eliminates uh, centrifugation, uh, were included in these diagnostics technology and market landscape guideline of tuberculosis uh, of UNITAID of World Health Organization. So we want to try this system without using the instrument in resource limited setting uh, like India. Uh, so by using decomics, we can do the contamination and concentration and inoculate to TK culture media, if we detect growth, now we can use ready to use susceptibility uh, test kit in order to detect uh, drug susceptibility, to identify drug susceptibility without having an instrument or anything, uh, you know, just you need a 37 degree centigrade incubator and you can do all this uh, without any instrumentation. So for this purpose, we provide a color chart where uh, the technician can compare the color change uh, to understand if there's growth or not in, in a, a culture tube like that. So uh, they have done a study in uh, you know India, uh, this was a PhD student, Shivya Yamal, who did the study, uh, and she obtained 500 sputum sample uh, from uh, the routine laboratory where they studied 
uh, by Kubica method and inoculating it to the Weinstein Janssen medium. And uh, she processed the samples by the comics and inoculated to TK media and monitored visually. At the end, uh, she was uh, able to isolate 130 uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis isolates in TK medium and the laboratory, the return laboratory, isolated only 110 at the same time. Uh, and uh, the contamination rate was much lower compared to the Weinstein Janssen uh, method also. Uh, and average time uh, for detection was 30 days in LJ uh, as expected and only 12 days in TK selective media in average. Uh, so uh, I will talk about a last thing if I have time uh, that we recently developed uh, by the help of uh, FIND again. Uh, here this is a, a we need something uh, really to screen uh, people without even doing culture, a rapid method uh, to diagnose tuberculosis. So there are some tests that can identify tuberculosis antigen in the urine. However, the, the sensitivity of these tests are very low. So we have recently developed a polymer uh, like this, and we put this polymer uh, into a tube like this, and we add 10 milliliters of urine of the patient. These polymers now will swell in five minutes and absorb small molecules of the urine, water and other small molecules and concentrate all the antigens and microorganisms that may be present in your sample. We have first tested this by adding some uh, albumin in uh, urine sample. This was the dilute sample that we analyzed by electrophoresis. And if we concentrate once and twice, you see how we can concentrate the protein molecules. Uh, we tested the lowest uh, molecular weight protein that we can concentrate by using a molecular weight marker. As you see here, uh, we uh, have uh, the molecular weight marker here. When we dilute it, we cannot see it the bands in electrophoresis, but after we concentrate, now all the bands uh, become visible again. Even the lowest molecular weight band can be seen uh, in uh, our sample. Uh, so uh, this is a, a tuberculosis uh, lamp test, a urinary TB lamp test, uh, where you put a few drops of uh, urine in your sample uh, to this strip. And if there is a lipoarabinomannan antigen of tuberculosis, then you get a positive band here, uh, as you see, uh, which indicates the presence of tuberculosis growing in patient. This is the control band that you can see. So we tried this before concentrating the uh, urine sample and after concentrating, I'm sorry, after concentrating the urine sample, it, as you see. So this is a negative patient. There is no uh, tuberculosis in this and you don't see even a band after concentration of the urine sample. Uh, however, uh, in this patient, uh, Band, we don't see any uh, positive band for TB here, but after concentration, uh, we start to see a band here indicating that the presence of tuberculosis. In this patient, you see a faint band first, but 
But after concentration with these polymers, now we see really a strong band uh, that indicates tuberculosis in this patient. So uh, we, to make the uh, application easier, what we do right now, we put our polymer in, the, in our tube and add 10 milliliters of uh, urine in this, wait for five minutes. Uh, at the end of five minutes, you see the polymers are uh, swell like this and absorb almost the whole uh, urine uh, here, uh, the fluid of the urine. So the antigens are concentrated. Now we dip our strip into this polymer. Uh, so uh, the fluid will migrate uh, here on the strip. And if there are uh, lipo non antigen, TB antigens, you will see a, a band here indicating that this uh, patient has RTB positive. So there's a, a study going on right now in a, a, together with the collaboration with the chest diseases hospital in Istanbul. And uh, we got uh, uh, so far 33 patients who have who are microscopy and culture positive of their sputum. And before concentrating the urine, we only got three uh, patients detected with TB lamp test. And after concentration, 20 of these patients, increasing the sensitivity from 9% to 61%. It was possible to detect some patients which are microscopy negative and some of also microscopy and culture negative patients, you can identify about 20% and 80% of even these uh, patients. It was possible to concentrate also DNA using this polymer. So it is possible to develop also molecular methods like PCR to identify in a, a bit, uh, you know, more sensitive manner. So uh, I think uh, we can create this way uh, diagnostic tools, inexpensive tools for every place uh, according to their capabilities. Uh, so if in high population where uh, resource limited settings, we need screening tools like this uh, My Magic On. Uh, that concentrates the biological fluids for rapid diagnosis. So I uh, thank for listening to me, to all you, and uh, of course to my uh, colleagues and students uh, who made this, uh, all this research. And this is our research lab in our university. And also I thank FIND uh, who, uh, who supported both uh, the development of TK culture system and also this My Magicon that we are currently developing uh, for uh, detecting the antigens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, very much for your very interesting presentation and I have one very quick question from you about this diagnostic test. Uh, these are based in Turkey or it's uh, available all other? Uh, I mean, this is just very new. Uh, we are using the uh, polymers. You are asking about the polymers, I think, my yes, magic yes. one that we call. Yes, we yes. are now started using this for COVID-19 diagnosis. What we do is we, we take, instead of, as you know, in COVID-19, you take your sample by nasopharyngeal swab, which takes only about 50 microliters, very little sample, and then you dilute it in a, a solution. So the sensitivity of PCR tests and antigen tests are very low, becomes very low. Uh, however, what we do, uh, we take uh, a few, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of water uh, in our uh, mouth now. Uh, gargle it and wash your mouth and put it back to the cup and give it to the laboratory. And in laboratory, we put
put 20 milliliters of this whole thing, which contains a lot of virus, as you can expect, because of so much sample. And then we concentrate it down to 0 0.5 milliliters. And then we use this fluid to do PCR. There's a multi-center clinical study to see how we can increase the sensitivity of all these tests. And if this is successful, it will be possible to use only mouthwash instead of nasopharyngeal sampling, which is very invasive, as you know, it makes very uncomfortable to patients also. So uh, this is what's going on now. And uh, so uh, we started already to produce and give to some customers in Turkey and find is testing for urine samples for TV. TV. Uh, there's a, a test produced by Abbott and Fujifilm, different, uh, you know, uh, companies right now. We are sending some samples to them for them to test the thing, but uh, the test will probably be available uh, in a month or so. Uh, first for probably COVID uh, diagnosis, then we will start using uh, for TB, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for accepting our invitation for this symposium. Now we'll move to uh, Dr. Marjani, who is the professor of infectious disease in Massive Danish Valley Hospital about the uh, latent tuberculosis infection. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the organizing committee. And uh, my talk is about uh, latent tuberculosis in Iran screening and management. As you know, natural history of tuberculosis is the. Uh, uh, Dr. Majani? I'm sorry to interrupt you. But uh, we cannot uh, see your slides. Oh. Do you have my slides? Can you see? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
as you know, latent uh, TB is a state of uh, persistent immune response to antigens, especially proteins of mycobacterium tuberculosis, with uh, no evidence of active disease. The risk of conversion from latent infection to active disease is about 5 to 10 percent lifeline, and uh, unfortunately, Unfortunately, one third of uh, the population of the world are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, screening and uh, treatment of latent TB infection is an effective uh, intervention to help national TB programs to reach World Health Organization milestone, which is this milestone is reducing the burden of tuberculosis by decrease in 90 percent decrease of TB incidence and about 95 percent decrease of mortality. How we uh, diagnose latent TB infection? For diagnosis of latent TB infection, we need a positive one of these tests, as you know, tuberculin skin test and or interferon gamma release assay and uh, without any clinical mycobacteriology, and if it was necessary, radiologic evidence of active TB. So we need four criteria for diagnosis of latent TB infection. Patient in the case have to be asymptomatic, normal X-ray is necessary, and uh, any abnormality unrelated to mycobacterium tuberculosis, if uh, the case has any sputum, negative sputum smear and culture is necessary, and positive test for diagnosis of latent TB, for example, tuberculin skin test or interferon gamma release assay. And as you know, with uh, this test, we can diagnose just immune response to mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, not we, uh, not. Uh, Mycobacterium cell. Short, term, short terms of tuberculin skin test. As you know, tuberculin skin test have uh, some short term. It contains more than 200 proteins, widely common between my, uh, mycobacteria species. And uh, it has some false negative results and some positive, false positive results. About First negative results. One of them is uh, the time between infection and conversion of tubercle skin test from negative to positive, overwhelming TB disease. For example, we uh, have uh, less than 50% positivity of uh, PPD among miliary cases immune deficiency, patients who uh, use immune suppressive drugs, very young age, vaccination with live virus vaccines, for example, after vaccination with missiles, we may have three months false negative of tuberculin skin test and poor technique. And false positive results are uh, related to Vestigial vaccination, routine vaccination in our country, and non tuberculous mycobacteria. They are frequent in the periphery, for example, in the water or in soil. New technique, recently, new technique is IGRA, interferon gamma release assay, quantitron and SPA. Quantitron is available in our country and uh, very popular. and uh, Fortunately, quanti in quantiform, we use very specific, not complete, but very specific antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis consist of SAT6, CF, CFP10, and TB7.7. And uh, for uh, this specific antigens, TIGRA is very specific for mycobacterium 
tuberculosis infection for therefore detection of latent TB, uh, and especially in our country, that vestigial vaccination is routine. In comparison of PPD test and IGRA, we think in our country, IGRA is a better test in our country and in the world because vestigial vaccination uh, is routine in our country and uh, we have problems with PPD test. On the other hand, technically, and uh, there is not any there is not necessary to patient come back for uh, reading the result. But the cost is our problem for IGRA and quantum. For diagnosis of LTBI, first of all, we have uh, to rule out active TB. We have to uh, in investigate about active TB uh, with uh, history, story taking. And uh, when we rule out active TB, detection of latent TB uh, is, uh, is done by TST or IGRA. And if one of them was positive, radiologic study is necessary. It is not practical for Ministry of Health to do screening of latent TB for the uh, all person in the community. So high risk, high risk cases should be uh, screened. For example, HIV patients, especially contacts, close contacts of active TB person who are candidate for transplantation, person uh, who are under dialysis, silicosis cases, and uh, the patients who are candidate for anti-TNF trap. About one third of act active cases, one third of active cases in our country has a story of close contact with a case of tuberculosis. And uh, if uh, close contact investigation, uh, if close contact investigation performed before the uh, conversion from latent to active TB, we can uh, prevent from this case. This is the rationale for these groups. All of them are persons who are high risk for tuberculosis. For, for example, among recent infection cases, the risk of conversion from latent to active tuberculosis is, uh, is uh, 12 more than others. What's the definition of index case? If, if we what consider close contact investigation, we have to know definition of index case. Close contact investigation are necessary just for pulmonary and laryngeal TB, and it is not necessary for extra pulmonary TB and for non tuberculous mycobacteria. On the other hand, uh, close contact investigation is necessary for, uh, in the cases of pediatric tuberculosis, for, uh, for finding the index case because. Pediatric tuberculosis is passibacillary, and uh, we we consider it non-infective. But uh, in the in the most cases, children are infected by one of their family family members. And what's the definition of close contact? Close contact is defined as living, as persons living to be together in the same house or sharing the same enclosed space uh, with the index case for uh, one or more nights or frequent consecutive hours during days. And what's infectiousness period? We, we consider index case infected from minimally, minimally three months before of uh, diagnosis of tuberculosis to two months after treatment initiation in parallel to uh, response to treatment. We 
because uh, resources are limited, so we have to consider priority in close contact investigation. In, in considering index cases, cases who are who have positive a smear for tuberculosis for mycobacterium tuberculosis, persons who have cavitary lesions in the lung are more infective than others. And close and in close contacts in the in the same household full of close contacts, transmission is more frequent. In concert, in considering the contact persons, children younger than five years old, immune, immune compromised patient, persons, uh, contacts who had silicosis and diabetic contacts are more prone to infection and conversion from infection to disease and they are in priority of close contact investigation. It is very important before any effort to confirm latent TB or any effort to treatment latent TB, we rule out active disease. We rule out active tuberculosis with any measure that may be necessary. Uh, mycobacterial study or imaging or other test biopsy. Uh, it is, it, we should rule out active TB before initiation of any prophylaxis. Close contact investigation is necessary for contacts of MDR TB cases. But because uh, these cases are resistant to isoniazid and rifampin, uh, we uh, we uh, does not recommend universal use of second line drugs for chemoprophylax uh, in these cases. And uh, we do uh, close contact investigation among family members of MDR cases just to rule out active disease. But we have to follow these persons, these contacts of MDR patients, contacts of drug resistance patients for minimally two years to rule out active disease or initiation of symptoms of tuberculosis. For other groups, for example, under hemodialysis cases, we prefer IGRA than PPD. And if we use PPD, uh, we recommend cutoff of 10 millimeters. But for very high risk, cases like silicosis cases or candidates for transplantation or uh, patients who are candidates of anti-TNF therapy, we recommend dual test, both IGRA and PPD. And in this setting, our cutoff is five millimeters, lower than other cases, because it, these persons are, are very prone to TB disease, TB activation. About anti-TNF therapy, as, as you know, TNF is very cytokine in control of tuberculosis. And uh, such drugs, for example, adalimumab, infliximab, etanercept, and others uh, were used for treatment of uh, rheumatologic disease, collagen vascular disease, and uh, they are popular drugs nowadays. But the risk of tuberculosis among uh, the cases who are uh, latent infected with mycobacterium is very high among, uh, among the cases who use these drugs. So uh, the cause of this problem is the effect of anti-TNF on granulum and the parenchyma. Briefly, anti TNF drugs rupture the granulum, and uh, the case under this treatment are very prone to activation of mycobacterial disease, especially cheap tuberculosis, disseminated tuberculosis, and very severe cases. 
So before initiation of this treatment, treatment with anti-TNF drugs, it's necessary to perform dual tests with PPD and IGRA to antipro. And uh, if one of them was positive, initiation of anti-TNF drug is forbidden after rule out of active disease uh, with mycobacter study and imaging. Uh, prophylaxy with isoniazid should be initiated and uh, it's better to postpone treatment for, uh, of the anti-TNF to uh, termination of prophylaxis. But if it is urgent, if it is emergency for, uh, situation, we can postpone for one or two months after initiation of isoniazid. Preventive therapy. There are several regimen for preventive therapy in the world, like isoniazid, the most popular regimen, isoniazid plus refumping, refumping alone, and refumping and is isoniazid and rifampentin. In our country, Ministry of Health uh, forbidden usage of refumping for preventive therapy because the risk of drug uh, emergence of the uh, refumping resistant strains. And Iran, isoniazid is the most popular regimen for prevention of mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is effective about 70 to 90 percent. And uh, it, is, it is very nice regimen, isoniazid plus rifapentin, because this is a weekly regimen, uh, once per week for three months or even one month. It's very effective with uh, very low adverse effects. But the cost is the problem and uh, this drug, rifapentin, is uh, not available routinely in our country, very limited uh, can be used. And finally, for follow-up of uh, cases who are candidate of treatment, prophylactic treatment, monthly visit is necessary. A routine baseline investigation about function of liver is not necessary because the rate of hepatotoxic effect of uh, isoniazid as monotropy is very low. Unless uh, the case has history of liver disease or alcoholic or uh, HIV infection or in the elderly person and in the pregnancy, that the risk of uh, risk of hepatic adverse effect of drug is higher. In pregnancy, we don't recommend to prescribe drug because it's not a, an urgent condition, and we can uh, postpone prophylactic therapy after delivery. And for individuals with abnormal baseline test. Uh, routine laboratory testing, routine test of elective is necessary. The risk of uh, liver injury under uh, monotropy isoniazid is lower than one person, and but is not uh, neglectable and should uh, be uh, considered. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks from Dr. Marjan, you were very detailed description about the latent tuberculosis infection because of the lack of time and we have three speakers for the remaining time. I will uh, uh, thank from Dr. Moniri, the Associate Professor of the Infection Disease in Macedonia State Hospital for his speech about the tuberculosis and HIV. Dr. Moniri.
این دنیا ما خوبا این سیچویشن بیت اسپات با تو پروگرس شیت این سیچویشن اسپیشال این اچ آی وی پیشن بیکاز اف دی استرانگ اپیدمیولوژیک اسوسییشن بیتوین اچ آی وی اند پروگرس انفیکشن اند دی کلینیکال کانسیدریشن بیکاز بیلو all individual diagnosed with tuberculosis are tested for HIV infection. In other hand, all tuberculosis patients we, uh, must, uh, must be checked for HIV disease. Due to need for ART treatment for HIV patient and potential for drug and drug interaction and products uh, reaction that may be interpreted as clinical worsening. Uh, potential for the ligand resistance to rifamycin when using intermittent tuberculosis therapy. Uh, we have a conflict in treatment in tuberculosis in HIV patient and need to discuss about these problems. In patient with HIV and tuberculosis disease, we uh, need for the uh, standard regimen. Six month regimen for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis in patients with HIV is uh, not. The time required for the sputum culture conversion for positive to negative and tuberculosis treatment failure rate uh, were similar to this in techniques uh, of treatment of KC in patients with HIV infection. In the treatment of HIV infection with uh, one problem is recurrence. Uh, some recurrence is uh, relapse. Relapse of uh, tuberculosis in HIV infected individual is associated with not adherence to treatment, use of intermittent regimen, or low plasma drug concentration due to a drug and drug interaction. All of the which uh, also contribute to the emergence of rifamycin resistance. In other hand, reinfection with a new string of microbial tuberculosis is built documented in patients with HIV infected at an according setting where transmission is more common, such as the uh, in country with higher rate of tuberculosis or living in facility such as uh, prison or hospital, that infected control is uh, inadequate. In some study, such as uh, one study in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, found that extended treatment from six to 12 months reduce their uh, recurrence rate from 9% to 3%. In, uh, on the other hand, a random trial in Haiti found that a six month treatment with a standard regimen, followed by uh, 12 months of INS prevent therapy, reduced recurrence from uh, uh, 7.8 per, per uh, 100 person year to 1.4 per 100 person years. Thus, in area of wheat, uh, in area where uh, reinfection is likely, the opinion of expert is that secondary prevention preventive therapy with INH may be justified. Uh, in treatment of drug susceptible pulmonary tuberculosis, HIV infected uh, patients receiving ART. We suggested, uh, we, we suggesting the standard six months daily regimen, but in the HIV infected patient does not receiving ART antiretroviral treatment during tuberculosis treatment. We suggested extending the continuation pause with INH and rifampin for additional three months, total dose of nine months of drug. In the patient with tuberculosis and HIV infected patients, intermittent tuberculosis treatment regimen and not suggested because of higher rate of relapse, emergence of drug resistance, and acquired rifamycin resistance. Relapse and resistance were associated with low CD4 glyphosate as well recurrence acquired in patients with based on CD4 count below 100 cells per microliter. Uh, based on data that show significant reduction in the mortality and AIDS defined illness, patients with HIV and tuberculosis should be receiving ART conjunction with daily antituberculosis medication. Three time, uh, type of treatment considers 
after two weeks immediate, eight weeks early, six months deferred of tuberculosis treatment. Patient receiving immediate or early ART has a 56% reduction in their relative risk of death compared with the patient receiving deferred ART. Initial ART. Uh, within two weeks of uh, starting anti-tuberculosis tr uh, treatment, reduced mortality rate by uh, 3,400 uh, percent compared to uh, starting for after eight weeks. In a population of HIV in this world with very low CD4 counts, more recently, TBA heart trial found that the patient with HIV and CD4 count above uh, 220 cells per microliter immediate initiation of ART did not reduce mortality compared with waiting until completion of six months of the anti-tuberculosis treatment to a started ART. We recommended that patient with tuberculosis and HIV infected receiving ART during anti-tuberculosis treatment Antiretroviral therapy should be ideally be started within two weeks for those patients with a CD4 below uh, 50 cells per microliter. In patients with CD4 count, uh, CD4 count uh, above uh, 50 cells per microliter, uh, should be started ART uh, between eight to 12 weeks after the treat, uh, starting of treatment of tuberculosis. An important exception is HIV-infected patient with tuberculosis meningitis, in whom ART should not be initiated in the first eight weeks of anti-tuberculosis therapy due to iris and other complications of treatments. Uh, mortality among patients with HIV tuberculosis, complication uh, of immunosuppression, conquest of the other HIV-related observed infection, thus potrium of total prophylaxis is uh, reduction, uh, reducing mortality and morbidity. WHO recommended routine controlled prophylaxis for all individual HIV infected people with active tuberculosis disease regardless of the CD4 count. One of the conflict in the treatment of TB in HIV patients is drug interactions. The most drug interactions with uh, TB and HIV antiretroviral treatment. Most drugs is uh, rifampin. Uh, rifampin is a potent inducer of drug metabolized enzyme in the cytochrome P family and drug transporters such as P glycoprotein uh, co administration of rifampin. With these drugs, uh, lead to re uh, reduction in the exposure and loss efficacy. Thus, protos inhibitor that metabolized by cytochrome P384, uh, concordant administration with rifampin leads to uh, above 80% reduction in the serum concentration of these protease inhibitor and uh, loss of therapeutic benefit. Thus, in the other hand, rifampin also increases the metabolism of NNRTIs, integrase inhibitor, and CCR5 inhibitors. In regime, uh, in uh, antiretroviral drug included efavirenz regimen. Uh, concomitant uh, co administration of rifampin containing anti tuberculosis regimen with efavirenz, resulting in satisfactory antiretroviral efficacy. This with reduction in the trough level of. Uh, effavirenz concentration. Effavirenz should be uh, administration at the standard dose of uh, 600 milligram per day in patients receiving a standard dose of uh, rifampin containing regimens. If, uh, if you use uh, nebirapin, rifampin uh, also reduction concentration of nebirapin. In other hand, due to the auto reduction, nebirapin should be administrated of uh, 200 milligram per day for two weeks and then increasing dose uh, to uh, 200 milligram per twist daily or 400 milligram once daily. Expert opinion in the nevirapine using during the treatment of which we found 
the initial dose should be at the full dose, 400 milligram per daily dose. Uh, con uh, concomitant use of rifampin reduced drop level of concentration of the lanticlavir and dolipiclavir. In some study, show co administration of rifampin based on tetravalent treatment and ratiagravir at uh, 400 mg twice daily was associated with similar antiretroviral effectiveness compared to ratiagravir 800 mg twice daily. But expert opinion consider both uh, increase the dose of 800 milligram uh, to its daily for raltegravir. In other hand, dolectravir as a dose, uh, uh, dosage of uh, 50 milligram given to its daily resulted in adequate crop concentration of dolectravir. One uh, drug in TB regimen is uh, rifabutin. Rifabutin is less potent and inducer of cytochrome P isoenzyme and may be used in patients receiving ART. Uh, on the other hand, rifabutin is said to metabolize both cytochrome P3A enzymes and antiretroviral agents such as portals inhibitor ritonavir inhibits cytochrome P3A enzyme. When co -ad, uh, administration of rifabutin and protoss inhibitor increase the risk of uh, drug toxicity such as uveitis uh, and the uh, need uh, to decrease dose of rifabutin co administration with the uh, protoss inhibitor. Thus, expert opinion is that the use of rifabutin at this dose of 150 milligram per day. Uh, as a part of combination in anti tubercular regimen of for patients receiving ritonavir uh, based uh, boosted phosphorus inhibitor. If a is also a uh, cytochrome P3A inducer, and then rifabutin is co administration with this agent, with rifabutin dose increased to uh, 600 milligram per day. In area, uh, that rifabutin is not available and treatment with quotas in four is required because there is a lot of other uh, active drugs. Use of rifampin with lopinavir may be attempted. In adult, double dosing of uh, ritonavir, lopinavir suggested uh, for the treatment of the TB patient, but in uh, children, Superposing of looking of it is suggested. One conflict in the treatment of uh, HIV and tuberculosis uh, is the uh, immune consumption, uh, inflammatory syndrome, iris, that is a uh, transient and paradoxical worsening of symptom, sign and clinical manifestation of tuberculosis after the beginning of the ART and anti tuberculosis regimen. Uh, overall, 70% uh, of cases were mild or moderate, and 30% uh, of the uh, need to hospitalize, and more than half of uh, receiving corticosteroid. Sign and symptom, symptom of iris, um, high fevers, worsening of respiratory syndrome, increasing size of uh, and inflammation of the uh, involved leaf node, new leaf adenopathy, expanded central nervous system, uh, system CNS lesions, worsening of uh, pulmonary parenchymal infiltration, new or increased pleural effusion, and the raw intraabdominal or retroperitoneal abscess. In some cases, anterior retroviral treatment that uh, not checked for TB, latent TB. Uh, in incubation loss or uh, subclinical tuberculosis may also result in uh, unmasking iris where tuberculosis symptom and clinical manifestation become more pro uh, pronounced. A starting ART within two weeks after a starting tuberculosis recovery have higher rate than those with, uh, who are started between uh, 8 to 12 weeks. 
development, development of iris does not worsen treatment outcome for either tuberculosis or HIV infection. And most episodes can be managed with symptomatic uh, symptomatic. An exception CNS tuberculosis. Uh, here art is not initiated in the first eight weeks of anti-tuberculosis therapy for patients with HIV infection and tuberculosis meningitis. Uh, for mild iris, tuberculosis and retroviral therapy can be continuous with and the additional anti-inflammatory NSAID such as ibuprofen. For more severe cases of iris, treatment of, uh, with corticosteroids is effective. Uh, Contract trial investigation, uh, whether treatment with non-NSAID uh, or corticosteroids can prevent the can prevent it, the uh, development of iris are under or underway or in the development. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Moniri. For our next speaker is uh, Professor Faisalabadi is our host, and we are a guest of the Professor Faisalabadi. And Dr. Faisalabadi will speak about the uh, role of the point mutation and efflux pump in the drug resistance of tuberculosis. Dr. Faisalabadi, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I restart uh, my presentation because some audience uh, have not uh, received my voice. Uh, Professor Tunnel uh, talked about tuberculosis incidence in details in the war, so I am going uh, to uh, make him uh, tell importance of diagnosing of TB with uh, rapid molecular techniques and the difficulties uh, of uh, detection of drug resistant tuberculosis. Okay. Uh, Resistance in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is mainly uh, mediated by uh, point mutation. So we do not have uh, mobile genetic elements that uh, transfer uh, genetic, uh, resistant genes uh, horizontally. So uh, mutation detection is very important, but it is not the only method for detecting the resistance phenotypes. 
uh, drugs efflux is important in the physiology of the organism itself. So it helps the organism to survive in a harsh uh, environment. Uh, efflux system also can uh, extrusion, do extrusion of uh, drugs outside of the bacterial cells. And in M tuberculosis complex, uh, several uh, efflux pump have been recognized and reported. For uh, the detection of M tuberculosis uh, from clinical specimens, uh, we have several rapid uh, tests that are approved by World Health, Health Organizations, and these include the Gene Expert MTB Reef, Lion Probe Assay, and NGS. We tried to use all of them in our laboratories, but we had some difficulties in detecting several strains. So exceptions are important. Uh, uh, at hospitals and also at the laboratories. I just want to mention about some exceptions in our uh, collection of isolates. So, uh, in this study, the 31 isolates, including uh, 10 susceptible uh, and 21 resistance M tuberculosis uh, strains were analyzed. So we did drug susceptibility testing using proportional method and then uh, to check uh, whether they have uh, mutations and expressions in efflux pump, we extracted the DNA and also RNA. So we did both of them. And then uh, to compare the result of sequencing for with phenotypic tests and efflux pump, uh, we sequenced the genes RPOB, CAT, G, and INHA. So this slide tell you the procedure at the laboratory, RNA extraction, real-time quantitative PCR to detect the, uh, or to quantify the uh, our expression, gene expressions. Uh, we analyzed uh, 14 efflux pump in this study. Previously, we used another 10 efflux pump and we found significant relationship between these pumps, gene expressions and the uh, level of resistance. And then, we try to see whether these efflux pump really uh, are mediated in drug resistance or not. So we use uh, CCCP material to block the efflux pump and see whether the MIC is changing or not. These are some uh, efflux pump you can see. It. So they can uh, extract the drugs from the bacterial cell outside. So these families' uh, genes were used in our experiences. Uh, there are several strains in our study that uh, do not, they did not show any resistance uh, in mutations. So the, they appeared as wild type, but they were resistance phenotypically. So uh, the genes that are involved in such resistance are RPOB as, uh, uh, at uh, nucleotide 531 and also CAT G plus INHA. So in sometimes in several cases, uh, we didn't see any mutation in such genes, but they show resistance. This table is part of the results. You can see the name of the strains, for example, DR11, DR12, DR13 on the left side, all are resistance to isoniazid and rifampicin. Uh, but we could not see any mutations at this uh, codon. Uh, so we tried to see whether uh, they are related to gene expression for efflux pump or not. Uh, for other genes also, we have uh, some examples. Uh, 14 out of 21 drug resistant strains showed uh, overexpressions more than fourfold, at least uh, for one or two efflux pumps. You can see the name of the genes, DRRA, RV, 1 to 1, HC. So these genes are expressed in high level. Yes? So uh, you can compare uh, the level of gene expressions in the strains that uh, did not show any mutations at RPOB and 
uh, cat and NH genes. When we use the CCCP drugs to inactivate the efflux pump, uh, you can see the amount of MIC reduced. So for example, isolate number one, the uh, MIC of rifampin was 64. When we uh, used rifampin plus CCCP, uh, the MIC comes down, it is now 32. So uh, this uh, anti-flux uh, or efflux form inhibitor was helpful in reducing the minimum inhibitory concentration of the drugs. Because of this, we believe that uh, we should not ignore the phenomenon of efflux pump if we are using uh, the molecular techniques for detection of resistance mutants. Of course, uh, the results were compared with both uh, line probe assays, uh, gene expert, and also NGS. Uh, so, efflux pumps uh, can contribute in the resistance development and the number of strains in our collection is not low. For example, five isolates, am I 31 isolates is not low, it is too high, of course. So uh, some other people try to use other flux pump inhibitors and see whether it works or not. They, in our country, they found similar results. If we try to use these techniques for detection of flux pump or we uh, uh, quantify the gene expression for efflux pumps, uh, probably uh, we may approach other treatments in case of resistance. Anyway, as I said, uh, the number of efflux pump is high, so uh, we should try to see whether the efflux pump inhibitors uh, are helpful in at least at laboratory and then probably in medications. Uh, we uh, should focus more on uh, INH resistance too. In our experiments, sometimes uh, when gene experts told us that the isolates is susceptible to rifampin, we check it uh, uh, again uh, using MIC and we found that they are resistant to INH. So working at the laboratory to check the MIC for these strains is good for research and also is helpful for making decisions on drug resistance and medication. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attentions. If there is any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Faisal. It was very interesting presentation. I have one question. This this yes, uh, flux form will influence on the result of the drug susceptibility test for the for routine testing or not? Not really. This is my suggestion to think about this because the number of uh, strains showing resistance to uh, rifampin at least is not low; it's high. And uh, gene experts and also Lyme probe assays sometimes have difficulty in detecting such mutants. They appear as wild type, but uh, they are resistance at least in vitro in our experiments. Maybe at the clinics is different. I am not sure. Thank you very much. Professor Fezabadi, and for the last speaker, we will move to uh, Dr. Nasiri, who is one of our young scientists in the field of mycobacterial infection, and I invite Dr. Nasiri for his presentation about the treatment of the mycobacterium avium complex. In the name of God, uh, this is Mohammad Javad Nasiri, uh, PhD from Shahid Beishti University of Medical Sciences. I'm going to speak about antibiotic therapy success rate in mycobacterium avium uh, complex. 
As you know, increasing incidence and prevalence of non-tuberculous mycobacteria has become an emerging public health concern. Mycobacterium avium complex is considered as the most common cause of disease in most areas in the world. Based on the current recommendation by ATS ADSA, the treatment regimen for MAC includes a macrolide, rifampin or rifabutin, and etambutol, three times weekly for 18 to 40 to 24 months. But uh, what are the challenges for these recommendations? Resistance to macrolides and unknown treatment success rates are the most common uh, problem in the treatment of MAC. Uh, in our recent uh, published meta-analyses, we evaluated the antibiotic therapy success rate in MAC, and furthermore, we compare the macrolide containing regimens uh, against the non macrolide containing regimen. According to our study, as uh, you can see in this forest plot, the estimated pool treatment success rate for uh, MAC was uh, 68%. This data was retrieved from 45 studies, including 38, uh, 62 patients. Our main finding were uh, that uh, macrolide containing regimen led to a better treatment success rate comparing to non-macrolide regimens such as aminoglycosid regimens. Furthermore, a poor treatment success rate of uh, MAC was observed in our meta-analysis. Uh, uh, meta so how to improve the treatment success rate? Recently, to improve the uh, treatment success rate of MAC, a new drug was uh, introduced, uh, clofazamine. Clofazamine has been shown to be effective for treatment, but there were no published large-scale analyses comparing a clofazamine to non-clofazamine regime in uh, MAC uh, treatment. In our another meta-analysis study, we compared these regimens. As you can see in this table, the clofazamine containing regime had lower treatment success rate than non clofazamine uh, containing regimes. Thus, our finding helped to assign a lesser lure to clofazamine for the treatment of match. Another important issue that should be considered for treatment of MAC is uh, whether the rifabutin is uh, effective or not. Uh, there is considerable uncertainty over whether one rifamycin is actually superior for treatment of MAC. In another study, we uh, also indicated, as you can see in this table, Rifabutin containing regimes has lower treatment success rate than rifampin. Uh, so based on our, our study results, rifampin may even be superior to rifabutin for MAC treatment. Thank you for your attention. If any question, I will be there. Thank you very uh, Thank you, Dr. Nassiri, for a very, this was a very great presentation. Uh, which drug do you find in your study that may be with more success rate in this mycobacterium avium? Besides uh, this drug that you say, for example, aminoglycosid, amikacin, or the injectable agents. Uh, hello, Dr. Tabarsi. Uh, you know, we uh, compare multiple drugs macrolide, aminoglycosid, uh, clofazamine, and rifabutin in uh, three different meta-analyses. Uh, based on our results, uh, uh, macrolide, for example, erythromycin, has uh, a better effect for treatment of MAC than the uh, aminoglycosid and uh, clofazamine and even rifabutin. Any regions that contain 
macrolides show a better uh, treatment for MAC. Thank you. I, I must thank Aden, I must thank from all the speakers that have very interesting presentation in this panel and I must thank from the organizing committee of clinical microbiology uh, of the Iran for this symposium, especially Dr. Professor Faisabadi for inviting us to this symposium and I think for the next uh, Congress we will have more intractable uh, discussion. At the end, I must also thank from audience that uh, were uh, on this symposium and uh, have very, and we have very interesting symposium at this moment and uh, say goodbye to all of you and I hope see you again after this COVID crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs>